Okay, well, I will officially start the event then today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We have nearly 100 people now joining live, um, which is uh, really, really excellent to see so many people interested in this topic and what our speakers have to say. Um, you will have seen a notification when you joined, of course, but as a reminder, this event is being recorded and will be distributed online afterwards. So I'm Ian Thrinaskiewicz, I'm Director Open Research Solutions at PLOS and I'm your host for today's event. Um, bit of housekeeping, uh, we will be uh, leaving uh, time for questions and answers and discussion uh, with our speakers today and that will include questions from the audience. Um, there is a Q&A function on Zoom so feel free to use that to pose your questions when they uh, occur to you. There's also a chat function, uh, which I realize you can ask questions on as well. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that as well for any questions. Um, we're going to have uh, all of the, the speaker uh, contributions and then we'll and then we'll open up for 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 questions for all of the speakers. Um, meanwhile, feel free to introduce yourself to one another and the world in the in, in the in the chat function as well. Um, also, I can see that we've just gone over 100 participants. So um, the topic today, we're here to talk about measuring open science, um, in particular measuring the prevalence or adoption of open science practices. And by practices, I mean sharing research results openly, open access, sharing research data, uh, sharing methods, protocols, code, software, public registration of research plans and protocols before research is conducted. Why are we concerned about measuring open science? Well, I think ultimately, I hope most of us would agree that open science is a means to an end. It's a means towards better science. Uh, better because it's more trustworthy, more efficient, more cost effective, more widely reused, and as a consequence, hopefully more impactful. Um, but this is perhaps more of a long-term ambition and meanwhile, how do we know if we're making any progress towards um, seeing or realizing those benefits? And a prerequisite to deriving benefits from open science for research, for society, the economy, uh, more fundamentally, we, we need to know the extent to which open science is happening or not, um, and also understand who or what might be being excluded from participation in open science and realizing some of those benefits. So as such, open science has a bit of a measurement problem to solve, both in terms of measuring the prevalence of open science practices and the effects of, of these practices, both those that we intend and also understanding those that we don't intend. Now at PLOS, which is where I work, we've been beginning to explore this issue ourselves, developing indicators for open science practices by researchers that publish their work in journals. Um, as a publisher, measuring open science helps us um, understand researchers, develop solutions that can potentially improve adoption of open science practices and understand their effects. But this measurement problem um, is certainly not unique for, for, for publishers. Um, and indeed, um, we're going to be hear, hearing from speakers who certainly aren't publishers that have been thinking deeply about this, about this problem, which has been perhaps brought more into focus in the last decade or so by growing requirements, policies, initiatives from different stakeholders, funders, institutions, governments, societies, and of course, publishers. Um, so to help us explore this problem, I'm really pleased to introduce our four speakers today who represent different organizations and different perspectives on this topic of measuring open science. Um, so each panelist today is going to speak for about seven minutes. Uh, they have a few slides to share each, and then we'll follow, um, as I said, with open discussion among the panelists and from the audience. So our speakers, our panelists represent um, funders, researchers, institutions, um, all who have been experimenting or innovating um, in this, this, this burgeoning, this novel, this exciting space um, around monitoring and measuring open, open science. So our first speaker is going to be Delwyn Franzen, a research fellow at the Quest Center for Responsible Research Berlin, Berlin Institute of Health at Charité, which is in Germany. Our second speaker will be Scott Taylor, head of research services and the Office for Open Research 
at the University of Manchester in the UK. We'll then hear from Matt Lewis, program officer at the Coalition for Aligning Parkinson's, uh, sorry, Coalition for Aligning Science, who also oversees the aligning science across Parkinson's open science compliance workflow. And he's based in the United States. And finally, we'll hear from Letitia Bracco, who is head of the University of Lorraine's Research Data Support Service and project lead for the French Open Science Monitor, which of course is in France. Um, so we'll hear from the speakers in that order to give us um, an arc of different perspectives, starting with the, the researcher, the, then the institutions, funder, national and, and global perspectives. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to our first speaker, Delwyn. Um, so when you're ready, please go ahead and share your slides. Thank you very much, Ian. I'll do that right away. Yeah. We can see them? Yeah, okay, great. Wonderful. Um, I just wanted to get them in full screen mode. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I think I'll just do it like this. So, um, yes, so I'm really happy to be here today um, and to have the opportunity to speak and be part of this converse, uh, this discussion, which I think is going to be really, really interesting. So um, just a bit about myself. So I'm a research fellow, uh, as Ian said, at the Quest Center for Responsible Research at the um, Berlin Institute of Health at the Charité. And so the Quest Center is a research institute essentially embedded within a larger university medical center and research hospital. And the mission of the Quest Center is to increase value and reduce waste in biomedical research and ultimately to make biomedical research more trustworthy and, and useful for scientists and society. And so we do this by offering different solution, uh, different services to um, incentivize, but also support and evaluate the uptake of responsible research practices. So that could include, for example, education, but also quality assurance and incentives, but also by combining this with meta research, where we try to better understand common problems in how research is conducted. Um, and that also informs um, uh, the development of, uh, and evaluation of new solutions to try and tackle those problems. Um, so, uh, as Ian already alluded to, so the topic of our panel today is measuring open science. But of course, measuring open science is not the um, is really not the goal in and of itself. What we really want to do is move towards science that is more open and and better science. And so, in that sense, measuring open science practices is just one component um, of of this this kind of more holistic process. Um, and beyond measuring open science practices, I think it's also very important to communicate these measures in a good way to those that can then go and affect change. So that may be individual researchers or funders or publishers or institutions, um, but that, that communication is really a key step. And then, of course, that is still not sufficient. I think in order to support improvement, it's really important to, um, to implement um, to try and understand what has, you know, what what actually was measured and what that relevant next step is to support improvement. So in that sense, implementing and evaluating change. So I want to just quickly pitch two pilots that we did at Quest to communicate open science measures at different levels. So the first is a dashboard that targets the institution. So this is a dashboard that shows the adoption of responsible research practices over time at the Charité. And the second is um, targeted at individual researchers. So here it's more of a support tool to support individual researchers to, um, to increase the transparency of their work. And so I'm going to briefly present these two pilots that we did at Quest and then finish off with a couple of reflections that are relevant for the discussion. So the first is this uh, institutional dashboard. 
Um, so you can see it here. This is just a screenshot of, of, of the first page. Um, and so as you can see, it shows the adoption of res several responsible research practices over time at the institution. So this, for example, includes open access, but also other practices such as mention of data sharing statements or code sharing statements. There are also more specific practices that relate to clinical trials since we're working at a research hospital. Um, and so importantly, it shows progress over time. I think you can see a good example of that um, for clinical trials. So this shows the uptake of summary results reporting for completed trials, um, completed drug trials, and that are legally required um, to post their results one year after trial completion. And you can see a massive increase um, over time there. Um, it also relates to other practices such as um, how well research data objects shared by Charité researchers conform with FAIR principles um, and, and more. And so this dashboard is publicly available. So, um, so really it serves mainly as a communication tool to support awareness and engagement on responsible research practices. And it really also shows, I think, that the institution values these practices. So moving on to um, the second example, this at the level of individual researchers. So um, this was developed specifically in the context of clinical trial transparency. So it was a tool to try and support individual researchers to improve the transparency of their trial. So here, um, the, um, the, the idea was really to try and see if giving feedback and guidance to individual trialists was effective at improving transparency. So you can see an example report card here that really gives feedback at the level of an individual study. So in each case, you see select transparency practices and you see how that trial performed on that practice. And then on the right, there's also um, a column that shows which action can be taken if needed. Um, so again, to try and support uh, researchers with this process. And importantly, these report cards were all developed um, with an automatic workflow. So it basically uses an input data set and reads in that data set and then automatically generates the report cards. And so this is essentially what makes it scalable and, and extensible. And there's also a preprint about this if you'd like to read further. And we we evaluated the feasibility of, like, of disseminating these report cards at the Charité and, and overall got quite positive feedback from, from individual researchers, which was really nice. Um, and then I want to finish off with a few reflections on some of the challenges that we've had. So one is that it's really been quite hard, like, like as, as a meta research institute, we've had a lot of agility to try and pilot new ideas. But then when it comes to moving beyond piloting towards a scalable and sustainable solution, this is where it's been a bit more challenging, often because we've had limited resources or, um, you know, in some cases, we're simply not the really the, the well situated or ideally situated to, to, to embed tools within, an, within a more kind of uh, sustainable workflow. And so for that, we've been trying to reach out to different stakeholders and the there's been a lot of interest, but I think that's still a challenge that we're navigating also because of the way in which, you know, funding inherently is for you know, a number of years and then it runs out. And then, you know, when it comes to making this sustainable, it's just suddenly like a, it's it's just, yeah, it's, it's you know, people look away. Um, the second point I wanted to bring into the discussion is just more generally how to measure and communicate open science responsibly. And here, of course, you know, indicators are often developed within a specific context that might be, you know, to uh, to do like performance oriented funding or just, you know, to make a customizable dashboard for an institution. But that also implies differences in how the practices are defined, operationalized and measured. Um, and I think even within our group today, we probably had very different ways of, of operationalizing some practices and for good reason. But it also just leads to the challenge that it just makes it a lot harder to compare um, and, and to interpret. Then there's also a trade-off, I'd say, between scalability and accuracy. And by that, I just mean that like, if you want to make something scalable, you often have to use automated approaches. 
but we also know that some of the data sources have limitations um, and so and often would require manual checks to actually go and improve um, quality. And so there's really a trade-off there and it's not always clear where the line is. And then just to wrap up again, or alluded it to already, but there are there, you know, when you're operating a, a practice or implementing it, often it only applies to certain, you know, for example, papers that are openly accessible or are in the English language. And again, this is an additional complexity uh, which makes it really hard to interpret. So those are a few ideas for the discussion. I want to thank you all for your attention and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Delwyn. Uh, we'll move straight on to Scott's presentation. Let's share your screen when you're ready. Yeah. Okay, okay. We can see it and it's in presenter mode. Go ahead. Oh, perfect. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Scott Taylor. I'm the head of the Office for Open Research at the University of Manchester. Um, and I'll be pro providing an institution level perspective uh, on the theme of this webinar today and share some of the work that we've been doing to track and monitor open research practices across our university. So the work we're doing very much aligns with our university strategy, which the library is supporting through our Imagine 2030 programme. A key part of this programme was the creation of an office for open research um, and the development of an accompanying strategic action plan. Um, the plan consists of five projects. And as you can see, uh, one of those uh, projects is a project to um, develop an open research indicator framework. And that's the project that I'll focus on in this uh, overview. So the, the indicator framework consists of three key work streams. Um, firstly, we, are, we want to so identify and define the things we want to measure and the things that we can measure um, in the first work stream. The second work stream is really around um, developing the infrastructure to manage this information that we're collecting um, in a scalable and sustainable and open way, uh, open as possible. Uh, and the third work stream is really around developing uh, a, a much more mature um, reporting mechanism across our university. So those are the three work streams. So just uh, sort of dive into each of those three in turn and go, and go through them in a bit more detail. So the, the first uh, work stream is around is, is, the, is that what can we measure, what can we access, and we've been uh, f focusing on, on on that work stream early on in the project, and we're giving it a great deal of thought and mapping out what we currently have access to, and um, some of the more exploratory work has involved working with key partners um, such as Data Steer, and I can see Adrian and Tim I think are on the call today. Um, we worked with Data Steer to, to um, we, we were keen to understand what the latest machine learning technologies might be able to offer in terms of extracting structured information from unstructured formats, such as journal articles. And so uh, working with Tim and Adrian and, and, and the rest of the data seer team, we uh, analyzed the sample. They, they see it analyzed the sample of a thousand journal articles from across um, our university where there was a Manchester corresponding author and, and the paper was published within the last 12 months. And from this work, we were able to develop a much um, richer um, picture of how much data, code, preprint sharing was happening across the, our different areas of research activity. So this is just one of the one of the um, slides that w came out of the analysis, which shows a breakdown of the type of data that was being shared. And so you can see there's interesting insights around that nearly half was tabular data, and then there's a sort of longer tail of different um, data types. Um, so, so that sort of exploratory. What, what can we, what can we access? Um, we've also been working at the sort of more national level uh, as, as, as one of the pilot institutions in a large UK reproducibility network project, um, which is aiming, amongst other things, to help define a set of, um, sort of provider agnostic, community agreed indicators for the research community to use to help us understand current research practices with, with perhaps more quantitative data to support um, that understanding. Uh, so Manchester is involved in two of the pilot projects under that work stream. Um, one that's focusing on pre-registration and can we 
to what degree are we able to measure the prevalence of pre-registration um, within different um, research fields? And the other pilot is around, the, again, around prevalence of the inclusion of data accessibility statements in journal articles. Um, and so through those pilots and through a range of other pilots, that work stream will be uh, working through this calendar year to um, uh, a, a, with an aim to share um, final outcomes um, early next year, I, I understand. So that's that work stream is all around sort of what can we measure, what, what what's possible. Um, the second work stream I mentioned earlier was the sort of infrastructure side to this work. Um, so in terms of our own architecture, we, we've developed an open source platform that connects to a wide range of external systems and internal systems within the university. And it allows us to combine all this data within uh, a system that um, is entirely within our control. The, the schema is defined by us. We It's fully extensible. As new indicators become available, we can include them into the schema. Um, so strategically speaking, we, we didn't want to be in a position where we can only store and report on data that our commercial CRIS system provides. We, we needed more flexibility than that. So you don't have to worry about this uh, spaghetti junction of a, of, a, of a slide in particular. But, but the, 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 the point there is that the, the bottom right hand corner, the open research tracker, the information in that system is, is drawn from a wide range of different systems. And um, the screenshots here, you can see a sort of back end system um, screenshots. Um, so um, you can see that we can cr create new records and it draws from our pure system. Then it draws information in from the pure system. But then this, this screenshot shows that these, these are all our customized fields. And, and as I say, entirely within our control, we can record whether a paper was shared under our rights retention system, state, um, position, whether there's a data access statement, whether there was a fund, uh, whether there was a data access statement, and, and if so, whether, where, where is it? Uh, sorry, if, is the data available or is it supplementary information or is it shared and is it in a repository, that sort of thing. The idea then would be that um, we, we could include code, pre-registration, methodology, protocols, that sort of thing. Um, the, currently, staff and students can access the tracker via the Office for Open Research website. That's within an authenticated environment um, and individual researchers can see all the information that we hold about their research outputs and staff with administrative privileges can access the full database. The next steps for this work are to provide richer visualizations and to develop a view of the data that can be shared on the on the public web because everything so far is under authentication. Then the sort of more, um, uh, the, the third work stream is just to fa so wrap it up, my bit up. Um, the third work stream, the project is, is is all about how we can take the data from the tracker um, and then combine it with even more information related to articles from um, our, our range of data sources that we have access to. So Altmetric Explorer, Scopus, Cyval, Overton, Web of Science, Site.ai, OpenAlex, OpenAir, all these, this plethora of, of data sources create basically a super set of information, um, which we've called locally the mosaic, and then build reports based on that mosaic through, you know, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, static PDFs, that sort of thing. Um, and the, 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 this this work stream is really um, take, it, the, we have a research metrics team who have primarily focused on citation sorts of information and uh, analysis around citation benchmarking and that sort of thing. Um, not really a team of programmers or developers, but what, through using the the, the, the latest um, large language models, we can prompt the models in plain language and and, and ask for fun, uh, scripts, Python scripts in this case, to do interesting things that were beyond the team um, before this was possible. So, that, I mean, the point here is that um, we, we, we think we can do some very powerful reporting uh, locally, um, in a way that was 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 beyond our capabilities twelve months ago, uh, we can produce charts, visualizations, uh, different sorts of analysis. So, uh, from an institution's perspective, sometimes that was a bottleneck. Um, what we the, the local resource, and I think the late the latest uh, developments within AI have changed that picture. And so, in the context of this this webinar, we think from you know working from within a library we can take this range of, of indicators that are becoming available and do some really, really powerful things with them locally to help inform insight and, and, and so on. So um, 
the, that's the idea of the mosaic, just to sort of a swish uh, slide I put together. Um, so that's, I'll end on that. Uh, but thank you very much for inviting me on to the panel and, and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Scott. Uh, we'll hand now over to Matt for your presentation. Go ahead and share your slides when you're ready. All right. Thanks, everybody. So I'm Matt Lewis. I'm a program officer for Aligning Science across Parkinson's. And today I'm going to talk about our compliance workflow process and kind of how we've done it uh, so far and um, highlight some data from a, from a recent publication that we uh, published that announces kind of what we're doing and how it's going. So just to tell us you a little bit about what ASAP is, ASAP is a funding organization uh, funded by the Sergey Brin Family Foundation that's really trying to make huge investments in Parkinson's science. And we're doing this in a variety of ways. We're um, funding a variety of programs that are shown here on this slide, um, starting with the Global Parkinson's Genetics Program. This is a goal to try to sequence 250,000 people across the globe uh, to better understand the genetic basis of Parkinson's disease. We're also funding an existing initiative called Parkinson's Progress Markers Initiative, which is really working in human patients to try to better understand uh, the progression of Parkinson's disease and develop markers. Um, and these two other resource organizations, IP, uh, INDI and MPD, are really dedicated to kind of more research infrastructure uh, around Parkinson's disease. The, the program that I that we spend most of our time working on, and um, especially with the compliance workflow, um, is this thing called the Collaborative Research Network. And this is a team science-based network. It's 35 funded projects. Each project is composed of about three to five principal investigators or faculty at you know, research universities uh, across, the, across the world. Um, and really at the beginning, at the outset, open science is, is really in the forefront of our minds, thinking about how to make sure that all the research outputs that are generated, not just the data sets, the code, but also the lab materials and protocols, along with the actual articles, are made open and publicly available at the time that these articles are put out into the world. So this collaborative research network is really a very collaborative and team-based space. I want to just highlight some, some aspects of this just so you can kind of get a sense of what we're doing. Um, first, we developed an ASAP hub. This is a virtual this is a virtual location where all grantees can come together and discuss issues um, that are um, at the kind of forefront of what they're working on. This allows us to have host video sessions, to have dialogue between them. You can see personal bios of all the researchers involved. It's a place where you can also share uh, your research outputs in a private setting. So it's specific just to the, the funded researchers. It's not yet in the global uh, public domain. We also have these interest in working group meetings. These are groups that are dedicated to sharing early results, sharing non-published data to be able to, to work together to collaborate on issues for us. Openness is really, is not, we're not doing it just to be open, but we're doing it to foster this collaboration between researchers. And that's really what we're putting a lot of focus on. And lastly, and for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about this issue of compliance review um, and compliance monitoring. So we have a very uh, strict, stringent open science policy for all ASAP funded publications. And we take very seriously this process of monitoring how grantees are doing, and we provide them feedback uh, on the on their, how they're, on their performance along the way. And uh, we use that information in our in future funding decisions as well. So just to kind of get straight to the point, this these kind of five points make up our open science policy in a pretty bulleted fashion. Um, we have a preprint re requirement, so teams must be sharing their data as a preprint uh, before or at the time of submission. The articles have to be immediately open access with no embargo with a CCBY license. Um, and then this point three is really the more important one here. All research outputs, so this is talking about data, code, lab materials, so things like cell, cell lines, organisms, antibodies, or plasmids, um, need to be shared along with protocols. And I'll talk a little bit about how we how we do that. So this compliance process that we've been working on uh, has really been kind of a definite a work in progress. It's been something that's been changing um, as we've been working together. But I want to highlight that this is a joint enterprise with Datasear. So we have been working with Datasear to uh, use their technology and their, and their knowledge on natural language processing to help us extract important information from the large amount of PDFs that we're reviewing uh, constantly sent in from our grantees. And so our process really looks like this. We have either a discovery process or where we're finding articles on the web using OA Works 
uh, as, a, as a means to do that. Or we are also working with the team project managers. One thing I didn't state earlier was that each one of these 35 funded projects has a dedicated project manager who is really supposed to be the liaison between the team and our open science staff and feeding us this information about, this, about their articles and giving us new versions of them, et cetera. So we'll get these articles sent to us. We'll then review them for compliance based on, on some metrics that I'll describe in a second. And we provide a data seer compliance report. So data seer and ASAP will collaborate to produce this report, which is a kind of a detailed spreadsheet that says all the things that we found and all the issues that need to be addressed. So it'll say, you know, you properly shared this data set, but the following three that we found in your article that you didn't share need to be shared and provide some guidance on that. And we do this for all the major research outputs that I mentioned before. We send this back to the authors. They will then make changes, provide us feedback, you know, saying, oh, well, actually we can't share this for some, you know, material transfer agreement issues, or we did share this, we just forgot to put the link in, all those types of things that come up. Uh, and then we will update the report and send it back to them. And this is something that we we really see as an iterative process. We do this many times for many articles. So we we want to see, uh, we, we you know, this iterative process allows the teams to gradually incrementally improve. And also we get to see, you know, how teams improve when they send us new articles that after they've gone through this process a handful of times. And when the final when the final article is published in this kind of last point, there's a publication report which sends we sent to the team saying this is how you did, uh, and we actually you know will pay APC requests for these teams, but the articles have to be compliant with our policy before we do something like that. And you can read more about this um, this paper this this process of this publication that's cited here on the top. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did in this publication that I just mentioned and kind of just describe our our criteria for compliance and, and how we went about doing this. So this is now a little bit outdated data set. This was early on in the, in the days of uh, in 2022, um, but we took 19 articles that had been sent to us in two versions, the first one that were sent to us and the second one that was sent to us. And we asked the question, what was the percentage of data sets, code, software, lab materials, or protocols that were properly cited given our requirements and the feedback that we prov provided to the teams? And so, um, there's 19 pairs. If one of the articles didn't contain a data set or didn't contain a reuse data set, lab material protocol, et cetera, we excluded that particular uh, article from the, the analysis. But what we're really going to show, what I'm going to show you is just the percentage of data sets that were shared appropriately, um, both that were newly generated for this article or reuse uh, data sets, and similarly for code, lab materials, and protocols. And the criteria and just what is required of the team is described here on the left. You have to include a persistent identifier that tells you where this, this, these materials are. You need to, if not, uh, if it's a lab material, you need to register your lab material for a research resource ID or RRID. Um, and protocols, we have a relationship with protocols.io to make sure that all protocols are freely available and they must include that protocols.io um, uh, DOI. So how are they doing? So. What you're looking at here in this slide is the change in performance between the first and second version of uh, an article that's reviewed by data series. Now, this is not a published article. These are all before the final versions have been published, but this is just early on in our review. Uh, on the left, the percentage of new data sets that are shared properly within the article uh, at, a, at a proper appropriate repository with the persistent identifier included in the document. And on the right, you're seeing the percent of reuse data sets that are properly cited. So this would be something like including the DOI for the data set, including the URL, perhaps, or the date that you downloaded that data from the URL um, in, these, in these versions. And so you can see that from the first to second, there are substantial changes to what individual researchers are doing. The gray lines are indicating the pairs. So the gray line connects the first and second version for that particular article. So this is, you know, we can see that we're having an effect here. It's not perfect. Um, teams sometimes, you know, the, the hard requirement is that this is done at the published version stage. So it's sometimes in these early stages, they still haven't properly shared their materials, but we're definitely having an effect by intervening and saying, these are the following things that you need to do when it comes to data sets. Similarly, when we look at code and software, this is another thing that we see has a you know, substantial effect. We can see that the code that they're sharing uh, is not just at GitHub, but they're actually uploading and linking that GitHub repository to Zenodo so that the version that was used at the time of producing the, the publication is frozen and, and saved so that future iterations of the GitHub repository um, don't cloud up, you know, don't mask what was actually done at the time the publication was generated. 
And similarly, on the reuse side, we see many teams are starting to properly share their tools more, more, more appropriately. They're starting to include the version numbers. They're starting to include the RIDs for those tools and the and URLs to where people can go to access these tools. And the types of tools that we're talking about are typically scientific computing software, packages in R, packages for Python, and a variety of other types of tools that are used uh, in, in biomedical science. Lab materials is probably the area where we have the least uptake and it's one of the hardest areas to intervene in because I think it's frankly one of the more confusing spaces in open science. Um, and the variety of potential things that constitute a lab material is pretty extreme. Uh, and that leads to some issues. So you'll see that on the on the left, the percent of teams that are actually doing this at the first, first time they send us an article. So this is before the final version. This is often sometimes before a preprint is ever put up is relatively low. And so this is something where we seem to have some effect, but it's not as substantial as we'd want at this point. And I'll say that this data is a little bit outdated, but we're working on producing a much larger data set over this past year. And we're starting to see some improvements here, uh, but it's still perhaps the area where we have the most, um, we have the least amount of compliance and where I think we need to intervene the most as a funder. But when you give the, on the reuse side, it's a little more straightforward. So here we are seeing improvements. We're providing RIDs for team for providing information to the grantees about what the resources are and asking that they just simply include this information in their article. The act of doing that, uh, providing the information is, is leading to a lot of improvements in how they're properly citing their lab materials. And lastly, I'll just talk about the protocol. So similarly, we're seeing improvements in protocol citations, uh, both newly generated and uh, for reuse protocols uh, in, in our publications. And this is, again, I think attributed entirely to our intervention, uh, working with the grantees to make sure that they understand what should be shared and how to do it. Uh, we've developed a lot of materials on guidelines on how to do this and how to access these things. I think uh, protocol sharing is something that some teams kind of already were doing, but there was a strong pushback among some teams thinking that, you know, isn't a method section enough? And, and in my opinion, that really often is not enough to properly reproduce protocols. And with time, we've seen a lot of positive feedback from the grantees saying, you know, this has really changed the way we train trainees in our lab. We show them the protocols, we show them these materials. It's a great way for us to compare across the various labs that are composing these teams to make sure that the methods are consistent. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, positive feedback on this protocol uh, version. So. I'll just kind of end with these quick takeaways, which are um, derived from this, and we talk about a bit about this more in the publication. So, you know, as I mentioned, sharing research outputs really depends significantly on what it is that you're trying to share. Sharing data is more straightforward. People, it's a more common practice within the field. It, it's it's not. It's not always done by any means, but it's it, people have a greater sense that it should be done and have some sense of how to do it. Uh, sharing lab materials, in this case, registering for a research resource ID or RID is, is far less understood. And it's frankly just a practice that many people have never done before. And this you know, user experience, the process of actually how to go about doing any of these things is very much a work in progress. There's a lot of need to intervene at a funding level or an institutional level to help people learn the best practices, to help give them experience doing it. I think the act of having them do things and working with them in, in a very consistent and high touch way is leading to a lot of change. Um, but it needs it needs to be further uh, developed in my opinion. And lastly, I'll just say that the need for a, there's a much larger need for the integration between the open science community and the researchers doing the jobs. And this is really thinking about the trainees. Um, many times when I speak to trainees, they are not actually getting training in open science practices through their graduate school curriculum. And I think that's something that really needs to change. Um, students are not familiar with fair practices. They are not familiar with research resource IDs or, or various protocol sharing services. And I think that that's something that really needs to change from the bottom up. And we're starting, and we're hoping at least internally to ASAP to be providing some, some guidelines there and some and guidance on how trainees can go about doing this. But I think this is something that will you know, greatly need uh, more emphasis and more attention um, institutionally um, going forward. So I'll just end and say, if you wanna know more about what we're doing, feel free to email us, but also to check out these documents, which are linked here. So two on the left is a blueprint for open science. This was generated um, early on in ASAP, kind of stating out what, stating what we're doing and why we're doing it. The article that I showed you data from and a figure from today is uh, here in the middle, this new perspective article from policy to practice. Um, it's now published at PLOS Comp Bio. And then lastly, we have our webpage where you can go kind of learn about how we're think about open science, see the team, see what their outputs are. Um, we're in the process of developing some dashboards similar to what Delwin was showing about our own, prog our own teams and progress. So stay tuned for those on the website 
um, as those come along. So I'll pause there and thank, thank the audience and thank the panelists. Thank you. Thanks very much, much Matt. Um, we'll move straight on to Letitia's presentation. Um, and audience, feel free to, to keep asking questions and panelists, um, feel free to keep answering them live if you wish to. Uh, Letitia, over to you. Thank you very much. So I have the quite heavy task to end uh, the presentation. So I'll try, I'll try to, to keep up. So um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm here today to speak about the French Open Science Monitor and um, to speak also on a more global level um, about the principles of open science monitoring that we are currently drafting. So, <clears throat> So to begin with the French Open Science Monitor, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of context in France. Um, so we had our first Open Science National Plan in 2018. And uh, following that plan, we had to um, monitor uh, the actual progress of uh, the, this plan. So uh, the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research developed a uh, first version of the French Open Science uh, Monitor in 2019, uh, which was at first very basic with like five or six indicators uh, regarding the opening of publications by year, uh, by publisher, by language, or uh, by type of publication, for instance. Um, in 2020, we were uh, the first university, so my university um, of uh, Lorraine, we were the first university to develop um, a local open science monitor based on the national one, uh, because it was um, an open source um, monitor, so we could reuse the code uh, with our own data to produce the same indicators. Following that, a lot of institutions uh, contacted us uh, to apply the same recipe and to have as well their local open science monitor. So we had more and more universities or research organizations who had uh, their local monitor. In 2021, the ministry developed new indicators about health on the national monitor following the COVID crisis. And at the, the same year, we also had a second open science national plan. Uh, in this plan, the emphasis was put really hard on research data and software. And um, that's why um, the ministry asked my university to lead um, the development of the national monitor on data sets and software. So we had quite a large funding about it uh, for this project um, because it's quite harder to monitor the openness of um, data sets and software than publications. Um, in 2022, since we had more and more local um, institutions who had uh, their monitor, we created a users club. Um, and in 2023, we could release first indicators on research data and software linked to publications. So uh, just a few heads up about uh, the progress of open science in France. So regarding the publications, we are at 65% of open access, which is good, but not enough. So we still have a lot of progress to ahead of us. Um, about data sets. So this one is quite original because um, it was uh, a first, um, first time we had this indicator in France. Um, it's uh, this 22% indicator that you can see is a proportion of publications in France, so French publications with at least one French author that mentioned the sharing of uh, their data. So uh, this indicator was carried out by applying um, machine learning techniques on PDFs. So um, Matt um, talked about data here. So we are using uh, also um, the algorithms developed by uh, the science miner company, uh, which is called Datastat, to um, 
to find mentions of datasets inside the publications. We also had uh, the opportunity to create the same kind of indicator uh, for software. So we can see that we have still um, uh, also a long way to go because um, uh, sharing is quite low uh, for now. Okay, so this was really quickly a presentation of the French Open Science Monitor. I will put uh, the link on the chat. And uh, I have a few minutes uh, to talk about uh, what we are doing um, for developing principles of open science monitoring. So um, just to give you um, uh, a heads up about this. Um, so. As I've said, uh, the French Open Science Monitor is now led by the French Minister of Higher Education and Research, the Université de Lorraine, and INRIA, which is a research organization in informatics. And um, during this project, and since 2021, we had uh, discussions uh, on how to include new objects in the monitoring of open science in France. And based on these research, uh, we had numerous international exchanges on the issue, uh, mostly with Denmark, Portugal, and Germany, but also with other partners. And we thought that um, from these exchanges, we felt that um, uh, we lacked um, something, uh, a, a global framework to indicate well, what are we going to measure? How are we going to measure it? What for? With which data source, et cetera, et cetera. So we drafted the first version of what these principles could be. And after that, we gathered um, international open science monitoring stakeholders and experts during a workshop in the UNESCO headquarters um, a few months ago in December 2023. Uh, so some of you um, were here and uh, we had the opportunity to discuss this first draft and to work on it to produce uh, agreed upon principles. So this final draft that we have uh, gathered is currently submitted to UNESCO um, so that we can have a targeted adoption during the autumn. So just to say a few words about these principles, we have three main principles, relevance, transparency, uh, self-assessment and responsible use. So what do we want to do with these principles? Where well, we want to acknowledge the diversity of open science monitoring approaches throughout the world. Uh, as we've seen during this webinar, uh, we have um, many institutions, countries, funders um, adopting open science uh, monitoring processes. And um, each of them has um, pros and cons. So uh, the principles are not there to classify or, or, or to say uh, which one is better. It's not the, the point at all. It's really to acknowledge this diversity of approach, but to provide guidelines to encourage pooling, comparisons, and reuse when possible. The One of the main objectives is also to help stakeholders like national governments, uh, research performing organizations, and international organizations to set up their own monitoring tool. Final objective, to monitor a comprehensive transformation to open science and its impacts on the research ecosystem and on society. So I saw someone in the chat, in the chat uh, saying that maybe we should not just focus on outputs. So yeah, we had the same uh, opinion, um, but it's quite hard uh, to evaluate the openness of processes, but uh, it's definitely something we want to um, uh, to reflect upon uh, when we work on these principles. So I guess my time is all is as handed. So um, thank you very much, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Letitia. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions, and thank you. Uh, 
speakers for answering the questions either either by typing or or, or in your case, Letitia, live in your presentation. So we have got a few more questions uh, that have come in from the audience. So um, we'll start with those uh, with the time that we the time that we have. Um, I'll start with um, there's a question from Kyle Briggs, which I think um, you know could apply to more than one one uh, one panelist, or could be answered by more than one panelist. It's about using these data availability statements uh, that appear in journal articles, and there's a question about whether compliance uh, is is audited. So I, I, the the extent to which these statements about the availability of data are assessed for their uh, their accuracy or or uh, the extent to which they're true is data actually shared when it's when it's referred to in those statements so does anyone have any experience or a perspective on on that question sure I can answer that so um we are definitely looking at the data uploads that you are that our grantees are are sharing uh, we're trying to make sure that they're in proper formats the file format specifically that they include readmes and, and descriptions of what the contents of these uploads are which are very often very important for understanding these these uploads we can't do everything i mean it's just the sheer breadth of scientific content is going from structural biology to cognitive neuroscience so it's very hard for a single individual to to take on but our open science team is, is actively looking at these things one benefit of our network is also that we have grantees you know kind of selectively kind of grouping into you know various interest groups and we have teams that are working on let's say single cell transcriptomics developing standards for how to share single cell transcriptomic data that's generated with our funds so we have teams that are doing behavioral analyses and various parkinson's animal models to develop standards for those types of things so we are trying to kind of get ahead of this reusability issue by having scientists themselves work together to define what is appropriate and necessary to properly reuse these data sets. So that's that's, that's a, an approach that we are taking there. That, of course, doesn't work for everybody, but it really works well for our, our particular network. Um, maybe I can say something as well, uh, just really quickly. Uh, we have uh, in the French Open Science Monitor an indicator regarding data availability statements. Um, it's really a simple indicator to um, show the proportion of um, publications mentioning uh, or having a, a DS, but um, this is not included in our indicator regarding the sharing of data sets. Um, to say that a data set is shared, we need to have a proper reference in the article, uh, a link to an URL or uh, the mention of uh, a data repository, um, but uh, just a, a data availability statement is not enough. And we are um, um, considering that if there is just uh, this statement, it means it's not shared. And if I may, I can just quickly add a perspective. So um, whether data was shared was actually looked at as part of a performance-oriented funding at our institute. And because of this, um, colleagues at Quest came up with very specific criteria on how to operationalize this. And so I've linked uh, to a protocol and, and a preprint on, on how this was done in case that's of interest. Scott, should I offer the floor to you as well? And yeah, I think I suppose at our institution level, the focus is on the 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 fact that we can record this and we rec record it in a more granular manner than just is the statement there. W what is the statement saying? I suppose this, the, the the sustainability side comes in there about how do you how do you consistently sort of um, capture that information? We do have um, a data stewardship project where we're we're trying to foster a network of people across the university who are doing data stewardship either officially because it's their job title or unofficially because it's just something that they've taken on and i think more and more i'd, I'd say that's the most scalable approach to sort of um uh capturing um well allowing people to um access support uh, sort of project lab unit level to uh, and I would imagine those data stewards would increasingly be involved in in recording information about data sharing as well. So I'd say that's probably the the long term goal would be around um, creating a network of people who have that as their responsibility. 
Thank you. Um, we've probably got more questions that we can get through. So I'll start with the one that seems to be most popular, because um, I think it's quite a general one in that uh, many, this is a question from uh, Raphael Mers. So uh, many of you talked about using automated approaches to check publications. And so in your experience, how confident are you um, in the approaches as they're working today? And would you have any f suggestions for people embarking on similar projects? Um, Delwyn, can I pick on you to start with? Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we've definitely either developed or used um, automated tools. And, and I mean, that's been really essential to make these approaches scalable. But I think we've also spent quite a lot of resources um, and time, you know, doing manual validations. And, and that's just been really, like, core right to finding out new insights and kind of edge cases and 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 to really think critically of how we kind of operationalize different practices what do we what exactly do we mean um so i think there's this is really a core like part of this whole process and i think in some cases um you you cannot automate practices for example when we looked for results publication of clinical trials you know, like research objects are not sufficiently well linked at this stage to be able to do this automatically, and we have to use manual resources. So that's just a few comments from me. Any other responses to that question? How confident can we be in the tools and what would you recommend to someone starting on this kind of work today? Um, I, I think, I'll oh, go, sorry. Ahead. go ahead. <laughs> All I'll say is that we the automation has greatly helped reduce the working with data series greatly helped reduce the amount of time that we have to spend to check for various types of you know materials within articles. But having scientific staff who are who understand the science and the data sets and the types of resources that are being generated by um, the, our grantees has been really invaluable in actually checking that the tools are are doing uh, what they're supposed to. And it's helpful to then, you know, go back to the tools and work and work with data to bring them information on the science that helps them improve their process. And then we can then check the results. So I think it, it, as much as we want to rely on machines to do it entirely on their own, we still need to do a good amount of checking and curation there um, to make sure that they're really doing what we think they're doing. Yeah, I agree as well. Um, for our project, um, we wanted to have precision and, re and recall uh, really high um, and to achieve um, a satisfactory percentage, uh, we had to do annual annota annotation uh, on top of um, what we already had uh, with the models. Um, but yeah, I think you cannot uh, escape uh, manual annotations, but in the end, um, it's rewarding. So, uh, so keep up. Scott, in 20 seconds, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I suppose we're still like a matter of months into these using these new tools. So it is very, very, sort of, for us at least, early stages. But I think from my perspective, I'm speaking as a librarian, I think this is going to become an essential tool for librarians we we I, I i see the research outputs being produced by a university as a collection uh an important collection that a library should curate and i'd see these sort of automation tools becoming absolutely essential for us okay thank you everybody i'm afraid we are out of time on the webinar um so i do want to uh, before the recording stops Thank you again to our speakers and panelists. Really, really interesting to hear those different perspectives and approaches. Uh, thank you to everyone that's joined online. The slides and the recording will be available shortly. And um, yeah, really interested to, I think, find other opportunities to continue this conversation. So thank you, everybody, and um, see you hopefully sometime soon.